nice day today. We try to stay outside, I suppose. But uh, it's a little cold. Pretty bright too. I wonder what I'm gonna do today. Maybe, uh, maybe I should watch a movie. Your videos are stupid. No one thinks you're funny. No one is watching this. Your family thinks you're a dumb shit. You watch VHS tapes like a moron. Your mom's very disappointed in you, and you don't call anymore. <gasps> maybe I'll make popcorn. Welcome to Video Hell Show. My name is Frank, and today we're here to talk about Warhead. Warhead is an action movie from the 90s and feels like it in every single possible way. Uh, it's, I think, I think it lives up to the uh, terminology so bad it's good um, in every possible way as well. First off, I love this movie. I think it's up there with some of the best so bad it's good action classics from the canon library. Uh, some of the Golden and Globus uh, classics. Warhead was released in 1996 um, from, let's see who did this, Vidmark Entertainment. I don't know that this was ever shown in theaters. I can't find any release information, so I'm pretty sure this was just straight to VHS. Uh, this here kept having uh, pop-ups on the screen that it was a screener only, so maybe they intended to release this and it never actually got released. Uh, uh, what I'll do here is I always do, I'll read a little bit off the box. Uh, the tagline on the front and some of the art here is a madman holds the u.s hostage with the world's most destructive weapon for a change that is true and uh very accurate and it shows a poorly drawn it's really early photoshop use uh, of and then you know target on washington dc and in the back um we get a little indication that somehow we're going to get $25 off a two-pack of what? I'm not sure. I guess movies. Uh, holdbacks, PPV, 60 days, cable, six months. Oh, so that's telling you how long this is supposed to be held back from uh, pay-per-view and cable. So I guess it was never intended to be, uh, again, something that was released. It was straight to, to TV or cable or, um, or straight to VHS. So the description on the back of the box here, an IRS building is blasted from its foundation. A U.S. Senator is literally thrown out of office by the deadly explosion. Spoilers. Fear grips America as the fanatic General Kraft, played by Joe Lara, and his united patriotic movement threaten the unthinkable. Civil war in the world's greatest democracy. Aided by Jessica, a beautiful young scientist. Lieutenant Tannen, played by Frank Zagarino, an elite special forces ranger, defies orders and sets out to stop this madman before he completes his ultimate act of terrorism the launching of a nuclear-tipped ICBM at the nation's capital. In a daring daytime raid, this, this shit's giving up the entire movie on the back of the box here. In a daring daytime raid, Tannen and his crack commando team launch a full-scale attack on the general's hijacked missile silo. As Jessica struggles to break the launch codes, Tannen and Kraft engage in a deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat. Tannen and Kraft engage in a deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat in a battle that will... That doesn't make any sense. That's a bad sentence. I'm gonna, write, I'm gonna read this the way it should be written. Tannen and Kraft engage in deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat in a battle that will decide not only their own fate, but also the destiny of the greatest nation on earth. Approximately 97 minutes, <laughs> also available in Spanish. And they have a website down here. So this is 96 and they already had a website printed on the back of their VHS, that's pretty good. So this was a, a New Image Presents a New World Production, spelled N-U, a film by Mark Roper. Uh, starring Frank Zagarino, Joe Lara, uh, and Elizabeth Giordano. Edited by... Uh, who cares? <laughs> Director of photography was Rod Stewart. <laughs> I guess uh, he took a break from making music and decided to um, DP this terrible film. Um, music score by Roberto O'Ragland. I think he might have TV credits. I'm going to have to look that up because I have a feeling all the music in this was very TV-ish. Uh, associate producer Bridget Olin. Uh, executive producer Avi Lerner. Danny Dimbort. Trevor Short. And produced by Danny Lerner. Directed by Mark Roper. 
what to say about Warhead? Um, like I mentioned earlier, it's basically a canon film without being a canon film. Uh, feels a lot like that. I uh, I really like this movie. I thought it was really, really funny. Despite uh, I thought it was I thought it was really good. It was really funny. It was bad, um, but it was just exciting enough, and they put just enough production value into some of the exciting scenes that it was actually very enjoyable. We get opening video talking about how uh, Nazi groups and the KKK are all expanding. Some extremist groups were banned, but members just joined other groups. And the young still shave their heads, a symbol of anger. They're growing their membership and they're becoming more bold. Nazi skinheads can now be found in most American cities. The best guess is they number only about 3,000 but that's 10 times more than there were two years ago. All things that have since come to pass, which is kind of creepy and weird. And then uh, the VO and all of the opening dialogue about how everything's going really bad ends with the Oklahoma City bombing and some footage from that. One week ago, at 9.02 in the morning, the lives of those in Oklahoma City were shattered. Many of our neighbors are now dead, some of them children. Really interesting though, over the opening footage in the VO, we get a repeated explosion at a police station three times, I believe, if I pay attention here. Here comes a feeling of danger. Some extremist groups were banned. Nazi skinheads can now be found. One week ago, at 9.02 in the morning, the... Um, they really, they had that footage, they must have made that footage of an explosion outside of a police station on a set somewhere and they wanted to make sure they got good use out of it so they used it three times in a row uh, I don't even know if they changed the angle but they might zoom in on it a bit it's really just repeated and funny we transition out of talking about white supremacy on the TV to a senator who is watching himself speak on that TV of the dead nine were children under the age of two we now cross to an earlier broadcast from Senator Brickman in Washington as chairman of the subcommittee, I think I speak for everyone. I think they say something like he works as part of the committee, but they don't say which or the subcommittee. As chairman of the subcommittee. <laughs> Not specific, it's pretty funny. Um, and he's behind his desk listening to his TV, he gets a phone call. Howard. And I hope you're listening, Chuck, because if I had my way, Senator Brickman here. And as he open or as he picks up the phone, he can't hear because the TV's too loud. And somebody's trying to talk to him. He's like, "Hello, who? Who, General Who?" And he lowers the TV a bit. Chiefs, are that we use every available military agency in this country. I'm listening. And he says, "Okay, now I can hear you," or something to that effect. And as he says that, um, one of the funniest things ever happens. Dude gets, the, the TV, this is one of the wildest explosions. The TV explodes, and then blows the desk up or back, and then doesn't affect the guy, but then does affect the guy in a, in a, in a manner inconsistent with the type of explosion. <laughs> and it happens in stages that he gets, he explodes, supposedly explodes out of the wall. But you see a complete desk, which was, closer to the proximity of the explosion, and he's further away from it, but he turns to dust. They don't show, they don't even use a dummy. They don't show any of that. And they might have tried, but it might have just been too hard to, to get to come out convincingly. Uh, my bet is uh, that there's cutting room floor footage of a dummy being blown out that wall, and I wish I had seen that. But instead we get a desk and a guy that turns to dust. <laughs> but the desk is in front of him and then the desk hits the ground intact and, and the desk explodes upon impact with the ground. None of that shit makes sense. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in the opening of a movie. We go from that to an opening push over a giant Bond villain map uh, with a bunch of little missiles on it. which I guess represent all the missile silos in the United States, push up onto who we can assume 
is the bad guy in his secret lair. Which looks like a pretty well outfitted base. Um, we find out that this guy, um, the bad guy, played by Joe Lara, can't remember his name in the thing. What's his name again? General Kraft. And he's down in his extremely, what it looks like, extremely well organized and expensive lair. And uh, we get a joke. I heard that Senator Brickman was thrown out of office. Ha ha ha. That kind of sets the tone of where we're going. And this movie kind of looks like, to me, again, made for TV-ish, and I guess that's sort of where we're at with the budget. A lot of TV lighting, a lot of, not a, I mean, there's some dramatic lighting, but a lot of, like, full lighting that looks like television lighting, which is interesting. Uh, interesting choices. It reminds me of almost like an episode of um, Knight Rider or, uh, but later on, or maybe MacGyver. That's kind of how it feels while you're watching, and that's the level of the effects and the acting and the music and the sound effects and the, uh, the special effects, all that stuff is made for TV. So the domestic terrorist group that General Kraft is working with is called the United Patriot Movement. Maybe they'll pay more attention to the United Patriotic Movement. The question is, how will history record this event? Again, something that sounds eerily similar to what we're seeing in the news today. <laughs> We uh, open after that explosion on some more opening titles with a guy driving a truck. We don't see who it is at first. This is the 90s. The UPM is not just going to go away. Now, we are talking civil war here. That's right. You heard me. Civil war. It kind of just uh, sits in the cab of the truck and gives you some establishing shots of the truck, shots of the radio, as we hear the radio talk about what sounds like a... Uh, it's like a Rush Limbaugh-esque radio show. Or it sounds Republican-esque. The UPM has repeatedly attacked federal targets across the continent with a purpose. The lines are drawn not by the Mason-Dixon, but by economics, okay? You're on the air. Yeah, ditto on that, Bob. Hey, for one, I'm sick and tired of paying taxes just to have them give all our hard-earned money to help foreigners raid our country, you know? And they're talking about um, the same kind of things today. Uh, civil war, unrest, division. Uh, specifically driven by this United Patriot movement, that these people are threatening civil war, and there's some there's some extremely overt racism going on. Like we need to take back our country. We can't let it go to these illegals or aliens. All the same shit that's going on today. This was 1990. I would assume four or five that they made this movie because it was released in '96. The exact same shit in this movie ended up happening in real life. I guess it must have started happening in the '90s because otherwise, where would they? have gotten the idea. I don't think that they were trying to tell the future. I don't think that they were soothsayers, unless I'm wrong, but it seems as though uh, either nothing has changed or they predicted the future or it's just gotten worse from where it was back then. They keep this air of, you know, Timothy McVeigh, ultra hard right wing pride and um, uh, Nazism and, and, and all of that boiling to a head um, with terrorist action, which with the recent uh, capital insurrection, I guess is something that ended up happening. Maybe they watched this piece of shit movie and got the idea from that. I can't tell you, but either that or uh, in this instance, I think art has come a little too close to, to real life for my taste. That said, uh, the rest of the movie is awesome. So these agents, uh, we come to find out one of them is Tannen, Jack Tannen. Uh, played by Frank Zagarino, and they're rolling up, and his friend PJ, his co-agent, uh, or his co-Special um, Forces Ranger PJ, and his team, which is in and around this compound, they are trying to roll up on a United Patriot Movement compound to infiltrate and destroy it. The one which I believe Kraft was currently uh, chilling in and, and making his jokes. So, they drive up on the place, and they were saying they're making a delivery. Morning, ma'am. What can I do for you? I got a delivery of dry chemicals here for Mr. Tyrell. Tyrell tell you to bring this here? No, ma'am, my boss did. All goes south. Uh, there's a couple of his team members that are on site, a sniper spotter who keeps making jokes. Good morning, Lieutenant, and how was breakfast? Okay, Viper's Den is 200 yards. I see five roaches on the tabletop. Otherwise, all is quiet. 
And it's a beautiful day. Quite, quite enjoyable. His banter is funny. He keep he cracks two or three different jokes, and he's um, knocking some uh, terrible sexual innuendo at the only female soldier, which is par for the course in a '90s action film or or whatever. It's just something that was bound to happen. Not great, but it is what it is. We get cuts back to the commanding officers in really cheap glass war room sets. Morning. Check. We have Lincoln Lovesack. You know that they were uh, low, trying to at least do it low budget, when most of what happens is behind different walls of glass. They, they happen in sequential circumference around one another, and you could see like people in the background doing their thing behind glass. Hallmark move of a lower budget uh, action film trying to make it seem more techy. And you can see in the uh, in the scenes where they're in the war room with the generals and, and things that um, there's really aggressive top lighting. Sergeant Victoria Palmer. AWOL, 928-95 Fort Bragg. Dropped out of the Marines to John Kraft in the United Patriotic Movement. And zero light bouncing around the room so that they can make it seem as though the room has more depth in, in the background and also so they don't have to highlight the walls of the shitty set that they're using. It makes it seem like it's a little bit more uh, full and real uh, just through some quick lighting techniques. We get a quick, we get a quick little banter scene where uh, they're talking about the woman soldier's ass. Garcia, cover my ass. Don't touch that ass, it's mine. Pretty ass. And the guy goes, pretty ass. Pretty ass. So fucking stupid and bad. Considering the intel they had on this United Patriot movement already and how many uh, people were at the base, you feel like they would have rolled in with a greater squad of people, a, a much bigger platoon, a much bigger squad of people. They go in with maybe like six or seven Special Forces Rangers, which I guess is a great tactical decision, but at the same time, like, you're going up against what is, amounts to be an, ins an insanely well-armed small army. <laughs> most of or some of which have military training and are ex-military so I don't understand why they would have made that decision but that's what ends up happening and they go in and they kick some ass and in what ends up being a, a fairly well directed I mean for for the budget action scene um, where I get a lot of explosions for my dollar was near nothing uh, very early on in the movie I mean these guys go in and blow up damn near everything there's a soldier that has a uh, has World War two rifle grenades in the in the 90s which makes no sense I don't believe we were using those I think we had actual grenade launchers but that's what the budget of the movie had so that's what they were using there's a great little scene where a chef gets blown out of the kitchen and they make a joke about it Oh man, well there blows breakfast. The roaches are out of the kitchen. Thank you, lieutenants. I like my cooks high up in the air. Well done. Next time, hold the fries. Stupid little shit like that. Again, very, very canon-esque. I feel like um, they missed an opportunity and they probably tried to cast somebody like um, Chuck Norris in this, but instead uh, they couldn't get him or Dolph or anybody else. So uh, Frank Zagarino. We get a lot of action scenes, the crappy 90s metal rock and um, we get a lot of slow motion work, like really bad slow motion work. Jones, hey Jones, where the hell do you think you're going? To the point where it looks like it's not shot in 24 frames per second. It looks like it's shot like 30 FPS for TV or maybe higher, and they slowed it down uh, for, uh, they slowed it down to maybe half that, I don't know. The, the slow motion scenes come out looking faster than they should, or they would if it was shot in 24, I could be wrong, but it just doesn't look right, and the slow motion scenes add no extra to what's going on, it just seems like they wanted to maybe extend the running time of the film, or 
they just tried to add dramatic effects, but it's just not, it's not impactful. It doesn't add anything to the scene, so it ends up being really funny. In this opening onslaught, there's a scene where it cuts back to the, to the general saying, no heroics when they go to infiltrate the under, under part of the base. Confirmed, out. Tell Tana no heroics, watch his ass. It's where, where, you know, uh, Jack is trying to infiltrate the underneath part of the base. Uh, the the uh, general says no heroics, even though we sent a small group of people to go destroy an entire base full of like 150 soldiers, which is insanely heroic. No heroics past that. There's a scene, uh, so Frank and, uh, and PJ are infiltrating their friends and, and p partners are infiltrating the bottom of the base. They come upon this guy who looks like he's a dead body, but I could already tell that they were going to make it so that he was alive. It just looked wrong, and they emphasized it. So the guy wakes up, tries to kill them both, and uh, is killed by just a boot on his face. <laughs> they don't make it like a neck break sound. They don't do any of that. They don't add a sound effect. He just gets a boot on his face and dies from it, but doesn't get stomped or anything. It's like if a boot was lightly put on your face, and that was it. So of course. Uh, General Kraft escapes when all this fighting is going down and the whole place is rigged to blow. It's a 90s movie, so of course the whole place is rigged to blow. Uh, and I'm glad it was. Explodes. Oh, fuck. We're losing signal. Get a booster on that now! Uh, PJ and, uh, Jack survive. And they go on to fight another day after, of course. We know that they're going to get yelled at. They failed, so they're going to get yelled at by their boss, but they're going to be allowed to have another chance. We get this this ridiculous scene where uh, there's a bunch of like military officials in a plane, and it's hijacked by Kraft. Reach altitude over the Caribbean. Enjoy your flight. Who is just in the pilot seat already when all these people board, and he gasses everybody on the plane but one person who he needs to launch the nukes. Uh, that he's going to try to take over as the plot prescribes. He gasses everybody, lands the plane. The team goes and finds the plane landed in Haiti. Uh, the team of Special Forces people is dispatched to go find the plane and try to track down craft. So they find it, and PJ, who supposedly is a weapons expert, as he says, too late, um, tries to go and pick up the gas canister out of the plane as a piece of evidence. Dr. Evans. You better take a look at this. It's from Pendleton. Hold it, PJ! But it's uh, booby-trapped and attached to a bomb. As he picks it up, uh, Frank Zagarino, or Jack, tells him, you know, don't do that. And he goes, I'm an expert. Jesus. You just triggered the motion detector. If you move that thing, it's gonna blow. Cannon, this is my field of expertise. And he, uh... If he was an expert, he probably shouldn't have touched that, but he touches it anyway, picks it up, and he's like, okay, well now I gotta cut the red wire, or you gotta cut the red wire, Jack. Now don't pull it. Don't yank it. Just cut the red wire. Such a huge trope. Goes and grabs the pliers, and of course doesn't cut the red wire, cuts the blue wire. I said the red wire. Son of a bitch, craft. And they survive. So I guess PJ isn't an expert? I don't know what the fuck they were trying to establish there. That doesn't make any sense. So after they inspect the plane, Tannen or Jack decides to make the unilateral decision that without approval from higher ups, they're gonna just tail craft uh, and, and his henchmen to try to stop them. He also knew we'd have to contact Ops Command before proceeding, so fuck him. If we move, we have no position backup. We gotta find Evans before he gets the codes. Which I guess makes some sense, but I mean, I suppose you probably want tactical approval if you're a military person. You likely would not uh, work outside the uh, chain of command and just go ahead and do that because that's not something you do. So that's a stupid premise, but they go ahead and track craft, go onto a bridge, which is a multi-tiered bridge. I mean, a set piece where you know it, nothing great can happen. And by the way, PJ has exclaimed now twice at this point, 
I have a bad feeling about this. I got a bad feeling about this. So, we know we should have a bad feeling about this as an audience member. They wanted to remind you twice. Excellent script writing. Everybody uh, starts to go over this bridge because they're trying to track Kraft, and of course, Kraft's men were waiting in ambush and slaughter everybody. <laughs> They fucking kill everyone. <laughs> and they're above a dam. Uh, Tannen jumps off the bridge to survive. PJ's the only one who's left alive, dying in the water. Tannen! They get uh, flushed. Uh, Kraft says, flush them. Flush them. They open up the damn doors to f sink these guys. PJ ends up dying. Tannen ends up surviving. He's the only one who survives and is disgraced by how terribly this all went, especially since he didn't follow orders. So, to make a long story short, um, this movie fulfills just about every cliche and trope you can hope to, uh, to think about. What goes on, uh, just in case you end up wanting to watch this one, I think it's worth watching, so I'm not going to go too crazy, but I think, you know, the bad guy gets his nukes, I mean, though he shouldn't be able to, these are very secure, no matter how much military training he has, and no matter who's behind him, the might of the U.S. military is up against him, and they are, or should be prepared, because they know he's, they know he's been a threat, and he's continued to be a threat, so... They, they should have probably had some kind of extra security involved, but no security, so he gets his, his goal. Um, good guy ends up having to redeem his performance earlier in the movie. Works with a, of course, good-looking scientist lady, much like a Christmas, I think it's Christmas Jones or whatever, in that Bond movie where Pierce Brosnan and, uh, what the hell's her name? Tammy from Tammy and the T-Rex go and uh, try to do something. I can't remember that damn movie. But, um, yeah, it's good guy try to go stop nuke launch. <laughs> and there's a lot of really funny stuff that goes on along the way. Lots of explosions. Awesome scene with jet skis and explosives on jet skis and a lot of like 90s-esque painted jet skis which look like they just got them from like a rental house or something. <laughs> that are somehow weaponized. Some of them are and there's a there's an, another onslaught at a base to try to kill people with what it, it's pretty cool that was fun there's a really awesome fight at the end where <laughs> the fight between Kraft and Jack <laughs> they go to throw I think Kraft goes to throw Jack and you could just see just in the, in the in the bottom of the frame there's the padding from the stunt work <laughs> is in frame and he throws Jack onto the padding. <laughs> Pretty funny. There's some stupid parts uh, near the end where Jessica uh, is trying to stop her father f uh, from launching these nukes who's working with Kraft and she's like talking to him through the computer. <laughs> another trope that you see in I think it happens in hackers it happens in a bunch of stupid movies um, but again really got a laugh out of me uh, and yeah good guy goes on to save the day in a really anticlimactic end to a fight uh, he just chokes the dude to death <laughs> Conditions closing. 
<laughs> it's it's pretty stupid. That's about it. I mean, uh, I I could go deeper into it, but it's a lot of stuff you've seen before in a, in a new package to some degree. I don't know if you could find it. I think it's really worth uh, a viewing. It's not the. I laughed a lot. I had a good time. It had a lot of decent action for the budget. Um, there's a couple scenes where fire's coming out of windows and stuff like that, and it's obviously like pipes, like gas pipes with holes in it shooting flame out a window. It looks like a, an attraction at like a theme park. But, um, I don't know. It had a certain charm to it, and, uh, you know, if you're looking to have a fun one to watch with your friends that will get a couple laughs and has some good action scenes and you like canon films and stuff like that, you may as well give it a watch. Uh, so yeah, that was Warhead. Uh, gets my vote of approval. No one will ever love you. Your dead grandparents are laughing at you. The cats don't even want to see you anymore. The 90s wasn't the greatest decade. Old crappy action movies aren't interesting to anybody but you. You're never going to be successful. Get better recording equipment, you're a jerk. You're ugly and your face is stupid. Pepsi's better than Coke. Your girlfriend thinks you're an idiot. And thank you for watching Video Hell Show. Uh, I'll be back soon with a couple new uh, fun things to talk about. And, uh, yeah, stay safe out there, everybody. Go and get vaccinated if you can. Uh, and, uh, yeah, talk to you soon. Peace. I don't pull it. I don't pull it. I don't pull it. Don't yank it. Don't yank it. Don't yank it. This is my field of expertise. <laughs>